Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Grunfeld, Chairman of the Speakers Program. So as not to delay the program any longer or enrage you any further, I'll be turning it over to Neil Diamond, who will be introducing the next mayor of Los Angeles, Tom Bradley. <laughs> Would you welcome, please, Neil Diamond. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I have to admit that I'd probably be a little more comfortable if I had a guitar in my hands. <laughs> but I have a song to sing, and uh, it doesn't really carry a melody, it, it, but it does carry an important message. A week from this Tuesday is Election Day here in Los Angeles, and hopefully most of us will be going down and voting for our choice of mayor. Uh, I think that the the time now is critical. We'll be determining who will be leading this city for the next four years. Uh, the mere thought that uh, Sam Yorty will get in again is a little frightening, I have to admit to you. Uh, but that's that's what the choice will be. It'll be between uh, uh, between Sam Yorty and Tom Bradley. And uh, I'm not really prepared to make a speech, but I did want to tell you a little bit about my feelings uh, concerning Mr. Bradley. And uh, I will turn it over to him right after that. Uh, are you crying at the mention of Yorty? Or <laughs> yes. Well, it, it is a little frightening. Uh, there are really three, uh, three attributes that I, that I look for in, in, uh, in my cynical way of determining who I'm going to vote for in any given situation. And uh, uh, I look for the depth of the man. I look for his compassion. And I look for his sensitivity. I think that what he does after that will be determined by how deeply those uh, those qualities go in the man. And uh, on all three counts, uh, I, I think Tom Bradley is uh, is somebody special. He's a man whose uh, uh, whose integrity and, and initiative are really unquestionable. Uh, at first, I thought before I came out here that I might just tell you a little bit about his background because it's uh, it's one way to measure the quality of the man. Uh, and as I ran it down, it sounded a little corny to me, because it's the kind of thing that a screenwriter would reject. But uh, it is truth, and uh, I think it has a certain uh, reality in next Tuesday's or the week after Tuesday's election. Tom Bradley is uh, is a product of uh, of a sharecropper, uh, poor parents, worked his way through UCLA, uh, joined the police department at a time when a man wasn't ashamed to be a member of the police department. Uh, in the 20 years that he was with the police department, he, uh, he worked his way through law school at night, had, uh, retired after 20 years in the police department, became a lawyer, was elected councilman in 1963 in his district. Elected in 67 and re-elected again in 71 by huge ma majorities. Uh, you know, I, I, I run down the story of this man's life, and it seems to me to be the classic American success story. Classic, maybe even more classic if he were, uh, well, come down to the realities of it. Uh, if he were a white man, these, uh, this would be the classic American success story, but he's not a white man. And uh, so we're dealing on a whole other level. Uh, Tom Bradley is, without any question, a man of integrity, a man of determination. He's worked his whole life for everything that he's achieved. Uh, nothing was ever handed to him. He is a sensitive man. He is a deep man. He's a hardworking man. And he's committed more than anything else. He's committed to doing a good job and impressing people on the kind of job he can do. Uh, I believe because of his qualifications, because of his uh, credentials, uh, he is willing, he is able, he is ready, and um, my feeling is very strongly that it's critical at this point that we elect him the next mayor of this city. Uh, what I'm here to ask you to do is very simple. Uh, I want you first to vote because it's going to be a close election, and uh, the votes that we cast are, are liable to determine what happens in this election. And also they will ask you 
after Mr. Bradley speaks, if you will volunteer a few hours of your time on election day to help bring this man to office and uh, hopefully take a positive step. Uh, it's a time now we have to question uh, our political leaders. I mean, this this meeting here is more a uh, an intermission from the Watergate uh, uh, investigation than anything else. And uh, it, it's critical. It's important that uh, if you believe in this man, if you believe in what he says, and uh, you want him to be the next mayor, it's not enough to believe it. You have to go out and vote and make your voice heard. And they also need your help. They really need it. And uh, that's all I've got to say. And now I'd like to introduce you to the man. His name is Tom Bradley. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Neil Diamond for being kind enough to come today and to make that introduction. Not only is Neil Diamond uh, one of the creative geniuses of our times, but a man of... <laughs> man of deep compassion and one who really wants to look before he leaps to have his support means a great deal to me because very often people will simply say, okay, I'll endorse, I'll support you, and they really have little information about what you're really like, what's behind the pronouncements that you may see in the campaign material or what you might read on the, in the newspapers. I was pleased that when we first talked with Neil Diamond, he said, I'd like to come and, and watch to listen to examine. I want to know who it is I'm supporting. And he wanted to take a typical campaign day in the life of Tom Bradley and just sit in, sort of in the background, and see what was going on. And we did just that. One morning we started very early. The first appointment was somewhere around 8 o'clock in the morning. He was there bright and early. It was with a group of educators and administrators uh, from the Board of Education group of Mexican-American teachers who were concerned about the quality of education and how City Hall can be linked to the Board of Education and what could be done there. We went from there to a conversation with a group of young black leaders who come from the high school campuses throughout our city who were concerned about school violence and the gang activity. And it went on and on, different groups and different kinds of issues and different kinds of concerns. He didn't intervene, he simply sat and listened and watched. And on the basis of that particular day, and uh, then he wanted to come back again, and he did. He wanted to get a full flavor of what Tom Bradley really is all about. And so when he made his judgment, it was on the basis of what he was convinced of in his heart and his mind. And it is therefore very important to me that a man of this caliber, a man of that kind of concern, uh, is helping. He spoke of our sort of a vacation or intermission from the Watergate hearings. And as depressing as the, the consequences of the Watergate hearings may be to the whole process of government in this country, I want to touch upon it for just a moment. Yesterday started rather uh, somberly with uh, Mr. Ogle talking about the whole structure of the campaign committee. But there was an, a note of levity in it. And again today, as the thing heated up, uh, one of the notes of levity that I'll refer to. Yesterday, as Mr. Ogle was talking, he, he said they were asking when he first became aware of the break-in, the burglary of the Democratic National Con uh, Committee's headquarters. And he said, only after I read about it in the newspaper. And you know, they call it a third-rate uh, caper at that time, and everybody was laughing about it. But he said, you know, I, I said, well, this could never happen to us in the Republican National Committee, because I got a guy on my staff by the name of Jim McCord. <laughs> well, that got a laugh out of the audience, because it was that very same McCord who, in fact, had perpetrated that particular act of burglary. And today, when McCord testified, he talked about 
one of the White House aides who was involved in trying to get him uh, to stay on the team and to keep the, the program on track, to try to tell the lies that they had so well programmed so as to avoid embarrassment of many other people who were connected with that particular series of acts. And he received a number of mysterious phone calls from this man, and one of them, he said, came from San Clemente. And he testified that uh, this man had been to San Clemente for a law enforcement conference. And again, uh, a murmur of laughter in the audience. How ironic that the great supporters of law and order were involved in the worst series of acts of political espionage, felonious activity, ever to come to light in the course of the history of this country. Well, the same thing may be found in other levels of government, and that's why many people are now turned off, and especially young people. They become so disillusioned with the whole governmental process and with our leaders at every level because of Watergate and the corruption which has surfaced at every level, whether it is at the state or the city level across this nation. And that's why it is so difficult today to get young people in particular to come out to cast their vote on election day. They've come to the conclusion that it really doesn't make much difference. And that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of attitude we simply must change. And you will never change it by sitting on the sidelines, by sitting at home on election day. It may come slowly, but I am convinced that we can begin that process. And you must change that process at every opportunity. It may only be one vote, only one election, only one candidate. But if you have that opportunity, I think you ought to take advantage of it. Seize that opportunity now. Don't let it get away from you. As we examine some of the activities in the Yorty campaign, I think you see a relationship to what has happened in Watergate. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yesterday, perhaps a landmark decision. You know, the courts are very, very skeptical about getting into political campaigns and ordering that some kind of campaign material be stopped. First of all, there's the whole question of freedom of speech, the First Amendment to the Constitution, which protects in the broadest way possible the right of anybody to, to say almost anything about a politician. And they're very reluctant to get in and to intervene and to adopt any order that would uh, sound like prior restraint of freedom of the speech. But there comes a limit, and that's exactly what the judge said on that occasion yesterday. And he said the lies contained in the Yorty main campaign mailer were so outrageously, scandalously false that even the First Amendment could not protect them. And he ordered that material destroyed, and it has been destroyed. <laughs> now, it's one thing to exaggerate, but it's another thing to tell a blatant lie, one that is so outrageously false the courts cannot permit it to be disseminated. And that's what's been happening with Sam Yorty for 40 years. When he's been running for every office under the sun. <laughs> the more recent candidates that he's smeared and attacked have been John F. Kennedy when he ran, Pat Brown when he was running for governor, Ronald Reagan even when he was running against Reagan. Jess Unruh, Tom Redden, James Roosevelt, you name the candidate who has run against Sam Yorty, and he has been under the attack, under the smear, under the outrageous lie of a Sam Yorty. And the interesting thing is that even in his denial of that charge, when he says last night, for example, well, the, the judge threw it out, but it really wasn't important. We'll say it again in a different way, and it will be acceptable. <laughs> but then he comes right back at you and says, well, you know... <laughs> He'll tell another outrageous lie. He says, well, what about the way in which they got that material? Sounds to me like, the, you know, it's another Watergate. Sounds to me like they uh, must have burglarized the printer's office in order to get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to turn the thing from his outrageous conduct 
to try to distract the public's attention by saying, well, there's something else involved here that's wrong. The fact of the matter is that one decent citizen who observed that material brought it to us and said, here it is. I just think that this is outrageous and they wanted us to know. No kind of espionage, no plan, no burglary, no improper conduct on the part of, of anybody in our campaign or anybody else, as a matter of fact. And then he, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I could go on and on for another hour talking about this man and the nature of his campaigning. Let me just mention a couple of other things because I think they are related to the whole Watergate scene. Not only the constant lies, not only the outrageous lies, but the whole effort to solicit campaign funds where you twist the arms of your commissioners and everybody else. And then when they give the money, you say, well, you know, I didn't know about that. My campaign committee got that money. Even after it's printed in the newspaper, he says, I don't know about that. <laughs> and then because they know that this is a violation of the law, a criminal act, they decide upon a new device, a technique, a subterfuge to get around it. And so one of his aides who makes about $15,000 has his wife make a loan to the campaign of $20,000. Now, where do you think she got that money? Oh, we tried to find out, and he, they were unwilling to say what the source of that money was, $20,000. He said, well, it's her personal business. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've discovered, for example, that uh, uh, Mr. Salvatore's claim that he assumed she got it by borrowing on their home cannot... <laughs> cannot uh, be substantiated because the fact is that they've already had a number of loans on their home stretching back over the years and it's mortgage for more than it's worth already. <laughs> so where are you going to get another $20,000 out of that home which is already over mortgaged? Well, some of that information is going to come out in the next day or two and there'll be more that will tie the whole Yorty strategy, the Yorty operation, not just of this year but of every year that he's run uh, to the Watergate mess. And I think that the people of this city deserve to have a campaign that's run on the issues instead of run on the basis of outrageous lies. I asked the mayor... <laughs> I asked the mayor on Monday night if he'd be willing to sign a fair campaign practices pledge such as Bert Pines and Roger Arnberg signed and that I am willing to sign. But he said, no, he wasn't going to sign that. <laughs> <laughs> and now I think we know why. Because that campaign piece would not have stood the light of day if he had signed that kind of pledge. And there are other items that are already being printed that he will be circulating that could not meet that test. I think we've come to the point in history where the people of this city and every section of this country need to begin looking at the candidates and at what they promise and what they perform. This city deserves a mayor who cares about all of the people. A mayor who's willing to serve the interests of all of the people, not just special interests. A mayor who's willing to try to protect the environment, not simply to try to have an Occidental oil company drill for oil in the Pacific Palisades or, or drill. Can you believe this? In the Santa Barbara Channel, you know, after the oil spill we had there, that's his proposal. When we want to tr try to stop the devastation of the Santa Monica Mountains, to have them, for, uh, you know, plan in a way where you don't chop off the mountaintops to build too many houses up there. Sam Yorty and his staff want to protect those who would develop the mountains in that way. I think the people deserve something different and something better. When we have an opportunity to develop a mass rapid transit system in this community, Sam Yorty talked about that 12 years ago, but that was about the last we heard of him until just a few weeks ago. And so we're still walking. <laughs> now we heard a rather strong castigation of Los Angeles and our rapid transit district and our whole plan as far as transportation from the Secretary of Transportation just two days ago. And he said that, you know, we have over a billion dollars in Washington. We're ready to give to the cities of this nation and especially Los Angeles because of its special transportation problems. But Los Angeles doesn't get very much because they don't ask for very much. 
and they haven't asked us for a dime yet to build a rapid transit system, so we haven't given any. Where was the mayor? Why hasn't he been to Washington to plead for those dollars? Why hasn't he been pushing for that kind of plan or that kind of program? Oh, he's traveled to Saigon, or he's traveled to <laughs> Bombay, or he's traveled... You know, <laughs> we got more sister cities around this country. <laughs> Every time Sam takes a trip, we know that when he comes back, we're going to find that he's, he's traveled to create a sister city or he's traveled to meet somebody's sister. Uh, uh, <laughs> we need to have him travel, yes. But what about adopting two more sister cities? One in Sacramento and one in Washington, D.C. He said 12 years ago that we need some initiative from Mayor Polson in order to fight the smog problem. And I agreed with him then. The names have changed, but I agree now that some initiative from the mayor's office would have helped us with our smog problem. <laughs> now, there are a whole range of things that I could talk about, issues that I'm sure you are very much aware of. But there has been a failure on the part of the mayor in terms of his initiative, his programs, to deal with any one of these major issues. He simply turns his back on them and says, I don't have any authority. I have no power. And he said, we don't have a problem here. Well, maybe he doesn't see the problem here because he's flying over those problems in a helicopter <laughs> or flying away from them in a jet plane. I'd just like to have him come down to earth for a few days and see what's happening down here in the streets of Los Angeles. That's where the attention ought to be focused. I'd like to see involved in the whole process of government and the solution of our problems. The vast resources that are available in our universities today, but they haven't been tapped. I'd like to see that done. You know, there's great, there are great skills there that can help us deal with the problems that affect this city, whether they be in the field of environmental protection or planning or consumer affairs or uh, economic development, housing, transportation, the needs of senior citizens and the needs of young people and in the field of education. Now the mayor says he has no authority over the Board of Education, so in 12 years he has not once met with the Board of Education in our city. How can you divorce yourself as the principal political leader in the city from the problems of the Board of Education? How can you go to Saigon, never once go to 450 North Grand Avenue to meet with the Board of Education? I simply don't understand that kind of philosophy. I believe also that there are great talents available among the young people of our community. And I'd like to see that same kind of energy, those same kinds of ideas, that same idealism harnessed and used in connection with our domestic problems. Now, if we could send young people abroad to serve in the Peace Corps, why not give them an opportunity to serve right here in our own city to help deal with the problems here? I know that there is a desire to do so, and it's a question of just tapping that kind of energy. I propose to do that. We have a great opportunity facing us on May 29th, and I want to add to that plea that Neil Diamond made. We need your help. We need your vote. We especially need you on the streets of our community on May 29th. You can help. We ask that you come to one of our election headquarters. There will be tables for you to sign up. But we need you desperately on May 29th to reach the people with a message that it's time for a change. Twelve years of failure is long enough. Twelve years of outrageous lies is long enough. We need decency. We need integrity. We need honesty. We need commitment in the mayor's office. And if we have it, I think that we can turn the city around. I believe that it can become the great city of the Pacific Coast Basin, one of the great cities of the world. That's the vision that I have for it. And I have that kind of dream because I grew up in the city. Since I was seven years old, I've lived here. I've had a chance to see its problems, but I've also had a chance to see its opportunities. I know that if there's any man alive today who can say that I have faith, I have some hope for the system, I believe that it still can work to serve the needs of all people. If I can say that, 
surely any of you sitting in this audience ought to be able to say it. Because I grew up under the system that said to me, you can't do this, you can't go there, you can't achieve this position, don't try to go to college because it won't do you any good, you know, black youngster, Negro youngster, that's what we were called then, can never, <laughs> can never make it. You just be content to get out of junior high school if you can. I refuse to listen to that kind of advice. I was told in high school, you can't hold this office on our campus because you're a Negro, and I refuse to accept that. I ran and I won. They've said the same thing when I ran for the city council. You know, no black man had ever been elected to our city council prior to my running. And I simply refuse to accept that attitude. I believe that this system, this country, promised equality of opportunity for every man and woman. And if it really meant that, then I was going to do everything that I could to force this system to live up to that promise. I've challenged, I've worked, I'm prepared. I've done everything that the system says you have to do. I'm now asking that system to deliver on the promise of the American dream. Not just for myself, because in the whole scheme of things, Tom Bradley is really not that important. I ask that this system, that our people deliver on that dream for you and those who follow you, especially for the young people of our country. I want them to begin to have that kind of faith and confidence in our country and in our system, that they will begin to believe that it really does mean business, that it really will listen, that it really will respond, that it will give an opportunity to every man or woman or child who is prepared, who wants it, who is willing to work for it. If we can do that, my friends, we will have done much not just for this city, but I think for this nation and for the generations to come. That's really why I'm running. That's really... <laughs> you can help make this dream come true, not just for me, but for yourselves and for your friends and for the young people across this land today, this generation, and generations to come. That's why I ask and plead for your help that we win this election for the young people, for all of the people, for the generations to come in this country. Thank you very much. There are standing mics at either end for those who want to ask questions. We only have time for two questions, though, because uh, the campaign schedule is really very tight, and we're behind it as right now. Yes, uh, I... I'd like to know if you're going to uh, condemn Jane Fonda for her anti-war activities. The resolution which was introduced by Mr. Snyder has been referred to my committee. As I do with every such file, it has been referred for our legislative staff to develop the background information so that that will come to the committee so that we can make a judgment about what is contained in that resolution. And I don't make any prejudgment about it or anything connected with it until all of those facts come before us. There will be a full hearing on it. Jane Fonda and everybody who is interested will have a chance to come to listen, to have their input. Uh, in 1968, the federal government financed many studies on urban transportation. Several of the resulting reports, including a lengthy two-volume uh, report by the Stanford Research Institute, stated that the only system that could reasonably be expected to replace automobiles was one using four or five passenger vehicles operating on elevated guideways and giving automated, private, and virtually nonstop service to its users. Uh, this system is, uh, has been working on aerospace, which is a consultant to Southern California Association of Governments, uh, that, uh, uh, that there are places all over the country that are working on this proposal, uh, or that system. I'd like you to explain why you advocate the commitment 
as I understand you do, of billions of dollars to building a train system that even with a good a bus feeder network is projected at handling at most 20% of the commuter traffic in the city, and that why you haven't directed your support to the development of personal rapid transit systems. Well, I don't know where you got your information, but let me tell you what my position is. At the moment, the first leg of the system is what I have been supporting and what I propose that we build. That first leg, in my judgment, would be a dual rail system because the technology that you have described and some other technology have not yet de been developed to the point where they are feasible, can be employed immediately. I believe that as time moves on and as we build that total system, we'll have alternate modes, and I will support them as quickly as they are developed. I believe that one of the problems with our system that was proposed in 1968, that it was so locked in to the dual rail for the total system. And I believe that we should have been looking to the year 2000 and beyond. So I support very much the idea of innovative programs that would deal with the best possible transportation system that we can get, one that will serve us into the future, not just one uh, locked into today's technology. I'll take one more. Yeah, I want to ask you, uh, to yesterday's court decision between um, Mayor Yorta and those, remember those leaflets he printed? With yes. The, okay, and I just want to know, it was one of those statements how, uh, that the court said was unjustified and truly wrong, even to the First Amendment, about your anti-police statements? Was that in that, uh, well, what I'm trying to relate is I saw a commercial last night with Yorty in which he pointed out and just said how you were anti-police, and I thought that that was something that the court said was illegal to publish in those pamphlets, thereby making it illegal to say on, you know, how can he say it on yeah. TV at late at night? Well, there is a, uh, there's another lawsuit that is now under consideration dealing with some of his commercials on television. Ours dealt with that uh, package, that uh, particular document which was published, and there were three, as I recall, three items that were very specifically uh, prohibited, and that exact language was prohibited, but you can use uh, all kinds of, of language that comes close to saying that, that's total exaggeration, that is in fact a lie, uh, and that's exactly what this material is. That is not uh, uh, prohibited under the Constitution because you're permitted to say almost anything about a politician. But uh, when your lies become so outrageous and so blatantly false, uh, clearly in the language, they are prohibited, and that's what the court said yesterday. The fact is that uh, on all of the matters that have come before the city council, my record as far as supporting issues, you know, I don't vote against or for the police department. I vote on the issues. And on those issues, over 90% of my votes have been yes. But on those issues with which I disagree, you know, I'm not going to be a rubber stamp for the police department or any other department. I'm going to vote my conscience. I have a yes or no well, I question. I thank you very much for, for the opportunity to come and to speak with you.